Welcome again, everybody, and thank you very much for coming here today. And a very special welcome today also to the readers and promoters of The Curate's Diary. The December issue of The Curate's Diary went out during the week. So a special greetings, to the, especially to the promoters who do such great work in promoting the diary. And greetings also to our YouTube family. I remember both people here, the promoters and readers of The Curate's Diary, and the members of our YouTube family every morning in Mass, praying that together we will come under the power of, your, of the Holy Spirit. That is part of the vision, that between what we're doing here, the diary, and the YouTube, that we will be able to make a little bit of a difference, create a little flow of God's blessing in the world. Special thanks to those of you who give the videos the thumbs up and those who place the comments on their need. Deeply appreciated. Today we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. And as we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King, let us pray for the grace to truly have Jesus as King and Lord in our own lives and praying for the grace also for our church. Our church today is celebrating the Feast of Christ the King, but to what extent is our church truly honored and honoring Jesus as King? And we pray for that grace. A couple of things happened during the week. One of them disturbed me, and the other one made my heart glad, put it that way. I'll share the one that disturbed me first. Are you familiar with a character called Mr. Bean? Yes. You'd be all familiar with Mr. Bean, Bean and the way he, uh, he acts out on television. Now, the best description, the best thing I could say about what I'm going to refer to is that it was a priest trying to do Mr. Bean while in clerical outfit. That would be the best construction. A French priest, a father, Mathieu Jazeron, the best construction that I could put on his actions and his, well, there was no words really. The first little TikTok videos. Now he has massive following. No wonder with the type of TikTok videos he's producing. Uh, what does it profit a man to have 400,000 followers and to lose his own soul? One could paraphrase the word of Jesus. And he has something close to 400,000 followers. But in one of the videos, he is coming across as a drunken priest, like somebody out of Father Ted, uh, if uh, people from Ireland would know what I'm referring to. And he's pouring um, the altar wine directly from the bottle into the chalice. And he's making all sorts of face, facial expressions as if he's not happy with the amount of wine in the bottle. And then he goes look to the sacristy to get another bottle. And when he goes to the sacristy, um, there's only a tiny drop left in the next bottle he goes for. And who has taken it? And he's looking around wondering what has become of the, uh, the, the rest of the wine out of that bottle. And then a young lady appears on the scene, half dressed as a nun. I'd say half dressed as a nun, because the bottom half of her is not dressed at all. Um, effectively nude from her undies down. Uh, but um, she is presented as also being under the influence of being drunk. And she has got the other bottle of wine and is hiding it behind uh, uh, her back. And he's pointing his finger at her. So presenting themselves as a drunken priest and a drunken nun, um, he with the, uh, the alb and stole on in preparation for Mass. Now, if you think that TikTok video is bad, the next one is even worse. Because in the next one, he's in full vestments, chasuble and all, in full vestments. He also, underneath the vestments, has some sort of a hoodie on him. Now, I understand that it's not a monk's hoodie, but it's a rapper's hoodie, if, a, if you understand why a rapper's hoodie might possibly be in the, in the music business. And um, he's behind the altar, 
and uh, he's jiving to some sort of uh, music. I'm not musical, so I'm not, I'm not able to describe that. Point. But he's jiving away to some sort of musical music, and uh, again making faces. And he starts tossing up the small altar cloths and making various expressions with his hands over the chalice, and then going further uh, with um, hands in his hair and making some sort of other signs. And there's a couple of people uh, also in the video with him looking on as if in horror and shock at, at what he's doing. And whatever. But you're the only there as part of the act. Uh, but that have every reason to have horror and shock at what he's doing. Now, I have to say, I was disturbed in my heart by those videos. Disturbed in my heart. Um, I, he has taken them down from TikTok, but they're available on other sources. And he has expressed sorrow for the upset he caused. He hasn't expressed sorrow for publishing them. But just for the, uh, if people were upset by them. Now, I would have to say, I would not be prepared to use those vestments for the celebration of Mass without first a ceremony of reparation and cleansing being done on the vestments. Likewise, I would not be happy to celebrate Mass at that altar without first a ceremony of reparation and of cleansing, and for the chalice as well. For the vestments, for the chalice, and for the altar itself. And it, it to my mind, it gets a little bit worse still. Because guess what? On the June the 24th, he excitedly tells his viewers, Rome has called me, the Vatican, the request of the Pope and the Secretary of State to play some sort of special role in the Synod of Bishops is coming up and the Synodal Path. And he says that the person that called him was Father Lucio Adrian Ruiz, uh, Secretary of the Dicastery for Communication to come collaborate with the survey for the Synod. And also, recently he was asked if being, this was on a radio or television program, I'm not sure which, he was asked if being homosexual or practicing homosexuality is a sin. Now, note that that question was confusing. There's nothing sinful about having same-sex attraction. Absolutely nothing sinful about same-sex attraction. It's what one does with it uh, is where the issue arises. So the question itself um, was not a good question, not well phrased. But he replied, I'm going to tell you frankly and honestly, friends, that obviously not. It's not strictly labelled in any place in the Bible, in the Catechism of the Church, in other words, in the whole of tradition. Now, if anybody wants to tell me that the wording of the Catechism of the Catholic Church is imperfect in the section dealing with same-sex relationships, I'm prepared to listen to that. If anybody is, um, wishes to tell me that it doesn't properly express the love of God, the infinite love of God for people with same-sex attraction, I am certainly prepared to listen to that. But when a person tells me that the Catechism of the Catholic Church does not in any way label such matters, I have to say, that person is not speaking the truth. And again, if anybody wishes to tell me that St. Paul, say in Romans, the first uh, chapter of Romans, that St. Paul, um, that he could have better expressed what he had to say about same-sex relationships, I'd be prepared to listen to that and to meditate on that. Maybe I wouldn't agree with it, but I'd be prepared to listen to it, to meditate upon it. But when somebody tells me that St. Paul didn't in any way label such things, I use the word label because that's the word, well, it's the translation from the French, but that's the word he appears, Father Jocelyn appears to have used, so I'm using the word label. But if anybody tells me that 
St. Paul didn't label such things, to use his words, um, Father Jasrin's word, then I would have to say, that person is not speaking the truth. The spirit of truth is not in him. And I have to say that it, it, it concerns me that people like Father Jasrin is are being invited to have some form of special role in the synodal process and the synod of bishops. Jesus says, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And the very first requirement to be open to the spirit of truth is to embrace, embrace the truth oneself. One cannot be open to the spirit of truth if one is denying what anyone can see to be the truth. Again, Jesus said, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and he will testify all about me. Again, Jesus said, and I will ask the Father and I will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. And then Jesus added, added, the world cannot receive him because it neither sees him nor knows him. Isn't that a little bit, you know, challenging? That if one is not open to the truth, Jesus is saying, the world cannot receive him. There has to be an openness to the truth to be open to the Holy Spirit. St. John says, they are of the world. That is why they speak from the world's perspective and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. That is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. And which would you say that uh, Father Jasseron's statement about same-sex relationships which is it inspired by the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception? Now, I already had concerns about uh, next year's Synod of Bishops. That's why every Saturday, um, every Saturday morning, I offer my Mass on every Saturday morning, I invite anybody who can join with me to join with me, whether present or in spirit. Uh, for next year's synod, that next year's synod will listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, will listen to the voice of God, and not to the voice of the world. And um, I started that, that series of Masses on Saturdays, uh, following statements by Cardinal Holleridge, who is a sort of the, placed by Pope, uh, Pope Francis as the head man over the synod, when he expressed some views way back, which are a bit similar to the views expressed recently by Father Jasron. And also um, Cardinal Holleridge um, indicated that the Synod of Bishops was likely to come to certain conclusions in that area. So what are people doing coming to all the meetings if those at the top have already decided uh, that our church is going to come to certain conclusions. It was at that stage I started having the Mass every Saturday, offering it up, uh, praying that the, by the power of God that next year's Synod would listen to the voice of God and not to the voice of the world. Cardinal Holleridge recently stated, and this is well publicised, and I've covered it a good bit into the December issue of the Curate's Diary. He says... It was impressive to discover the enthusiasm and creativity of all these groups. That's all the groups that were meeting. It was clear from the very first weeks that the Spirit was at work. Now I'm in full agreement with the first half of the statement uh, that it was impressive to discover the, uh, the enthusiasm and creativity of all these groups. I was at one of the meetings and I was impressed. I was impressed by the enthusiasm. So I must say that older people are pretty near older people at that particular meeting were people who truly had accepted Jesus as Lord in their lives. And that, that was 
um, very much came out in what in what they shared. But I was impressed. But is enthusiasm and the creativity is that proof that the Holy Spirit is at work in a situation? Now that's an important question to ask. Take, for example, citizens' assemblies here in Ireland. Um, wasn't a great enthusiasm about them. But didn't have a lot of creativity. They also concluded that there should be abortion up to a certain number of weeks. So is in that case the fact that there was enthusiasm and creativity, is, is it a sign that, uh, that abortion is of the Holy Spirit? It's certainly not, isn't it? Um, so the fact that there is enthusiasm, welcome, welcome, come ahead in. The fact that there is enthusiasm and creativity is not a guarantee that something is the Holy Spirit at work. That's important to remember. Or take something more recently over in our neighboring country of Great Britain. Was there not great enthusiasm uh, amongst the ordinary people for the election of Liz Truss as their prime minister? And gosh, where did that lead to? Was that the work of the Holy Spirit? So taking enthusiasm and creativity as proof of the work of the Holy Spirit, I would suggest to you is bad logic. It just does not follow. And indeed, worse than presuming that something is the work of the Holy Spirit is claiming that what one is doing oneself is the work of the Holy Spirit. We should indeed pray for total openness to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But we should be very, very slow to claim that the work we are doing, are carrying out, that we have the Holy Spirit behind us. We may not have. We should seek to have. But we may not have. Claiming that the work that one is doing has the Holy Spirit behind, behind us, that is a form of the sin of presumption. And very often where, where you find that, there's something of the sin of pride and something of self-deception and sometimes shallowness of character where, where one finds that person, oh, uh, maybe a person gets into a bit of trouble, oh, I had the Holy Spirit behind me. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. When I hear people... Um, the, of the Synod inviting people like Father Chazeron to be in any way part of the process. It gives me concerns. It causes grief in my heart. And I, I did have grief in my heart for a couple of days this week. And my heart was troubled a bit by this and I was bringing it before God. And then I saw something on YouTube that completely lifted my spirit completely and totally lifted my, lifted my spirit. Now, I'm not going to attempt to show Father Jazeron's videos in my video. No way whatsoever. However, I am going to attempt to show the next thing I'm going to tell you about. I'm not able to download stuff on you, from YouTube, so all I can do is set my camera up to video it as it's playing on my computer. So it'll be imperfect. But back in July, there was an event being held down in Mexico, a special event, and they had a priest then, and there was a big occasion. And after the evening mass, there was exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. And as they were there in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, they started to see the Blessed Sacrament pulsating. beating as like a heartbeat. And uh, now we always have to be careful about these things. We always have to ask ourselves, well, could there be some sort of skullduggery going on? Or could it be some sort of a 
an impression that's not for real. However, in this case, I would have to say I'm impressed. I accept that it's for the church to make ultimate decisions. But I believe it was a miracle. Two people who were present, they held up their mobile phones and started recording it. And you can see the sacred host pulsating, 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 pulsating. Um, it, they timed it that it's beaten at 80 beats to a minute. And um, the, the human heartbeat, I believe, uh, anything from 60 to 100 to a minute as within the range of normal, and when it goes up that bit higher, like 80 to a minute, it can be a sign that the person is under pressure, that the person is suffering. Now again, we have to be cautious, uh, but I think the fact that there was two different uh, cameras used, the, when a person holds up a camera, they're not going to hold the camera steady, um, their hand will wa waver around the place, and in fact I didn't do a great job on recording it because it was uh, the, the person's camera was waving around the spot and uh, it went below where I was recording at one stage because of that. But the fact that regardless of where the camera was held, that one could still see the Blessed Sacrament pulsating uh, is a very good sign. The fact that two people recorded it is a very good sign. The fact that the priest, um, there was a special priest there that night who was a little bit more advanced than, shall we say, the ordinary priest, and he asked for the recordings immediately after the session so that no, they couldn't be in any way tampered with. Uh, that's a very good sign. Now, modern technology, and I'm not so sure that down in Mexico that would be the most advanced in modern technology. Um, maybe, maybe not. But how modern technology could be worked upon to create that impression, I don't know. But as I saw that, it gave me total confidence to believe that Jesus is Lord. And that whatever concerns we have about next year's synodal path or next year's synodal bishops and the way the church is going at the moment and the issues in the church and given Father Jasseron, I have to say there are problems in the church. There are problems in the church. And instead of, if I had anything to do with it, uh, instead of um, inviting them to have some sort of role in this uh, synodal process, I would be seeking out, could, could one find a suitable retreat for him to go on? Um, and a prolonged retreat at that. There are problems within the church. And I cannot see how uh, one could truly have love for God and love and respect for Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament and still produce the type of videos he produced. I, I just can't see how it is possible. In fact, I found myself thinking of how uh, St. Faustina on one occasion, she said, I saw how unwillingly the Lord Jesus came to certain souls in Holy Communion. And he spoke these words to me. I enter into, second, into certain hearts as into a second passion. Now again, obviously it's not for me to judge Father Jasron, but that's the way I feel. That's my personal feelings about the videos that he produced. I cannot see how a priest could love God, could love Jesus, could love and respect the Holy Mass. And if a priest hasn't got love and respect for the Holy Mass, what has he? But I can't see how a priest could have love and respect for the Holy Mass and produce those sorts of videos. But on the other hand then, when I watched what appears to be the sacred host pulsating,
And there was another little element to it as well. Incidentally, the sacred host, when the whole thing was over, the sacred host was still the exact same sacred host. It hadn't changed into the body and blo into the uh, body of Jesus' flesh or anything like that. The same sacred host, but yet it seemed so real. But there was another little element to it as well. Seemingly, there was some element that night of devotion uh, to Blessed Carlos Acuto, is that his name? Mm -hmm. And that that same night, an image of Blessed Carlos Acuto uh, that had started um, to emanate some sort of oil um, at this, roughly the same time. And Blessed Carlos Acutos, he was very big on Eucharistic miracles, mm -hmm. promoting Eucharistic miracles, and using modern technology to promote Eucharistic mir miracles. And there that night, m smartphones, modern technology, was used to record what to my mind appears to be, and I'm open to the possibility I'm wrong, but at the moment, until I hear better, I say that what I saw was a miracle. And it lifts my heart, and it gives me faith to believe that whatever problems we have in our church, that God is still God, and that it's still his church. And while we do our best as regards doing what we can to ensure that our church walks in the right way, we don't have to do the whole thing. God is still God. And we pray today on this, the feast of Christ the King, Lord Jesus, we pray for the grace to truly 100% accept you as Lord and King in our lives. And we pray, Lord Jesus, for anybody either here present or watching this on YouTube who has... Come ahead. Come ahead. You're most welcome. All right. Yeah, you're most welcome. The two of you. But for anybody who is either watching this on YouTube or here present who is downcast at the present time or facing a a real problem at the present time. I pray for you to grace to know that God is still God, that Jesus loves you, that he is with you. I pray for you to grace to surrender everything into his hands with trust in his love for you. And I pray for his blessing to go out to you. And I also ask a special blessing for all those who, after last Sunday's video on the Green Scapular, uh, were praying for the conversion of family members. Praying, Lord Jesus, that your anointing may come upon all who are seeking to bring about the conversion of family members. That your blessing may come upon them. And that when people get the Green Scaplers to give to people, we pray your blessing. Your blessing be upon every effort anybody makes, whether it's your miraculous medals or green scapulars or booklets or the curate's diary or whatever, that your blessing and wisdom, wisdom to know when to give things, courage to be able to give things, generosity indeed to be able to give things, and your blessing to go out to every person that we are claiming for the Lord Jesus. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your holy word, the Bible. Lord Jesus, we accept you as our Lord and King. And that means, Lord, we accept that you know best. And we accept what we have here in the Holy Bible especially in the New Testament, as your word, as your true word. And we commit ourselves, Lord Jesus, to the truth, to always speaking the truth, and your word is truth, to always being loyal to your holy word, to giving faithful witness to you. And we pray, Lord, that your holy word will be proclaimed through all the earth. We pray, Lord Jesus, that our church may truly embrace your word, may be guided by your word, may walk in your word, 
may witness thee a word in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.